Analytical Chemistry 1, Lesson 45. Titrations using precipitation processes can be established. An analyte is being removed from the aqueous part of the system as it precipitates. If we have a means of determining that concentration change, we can measure the titration curve and find the endpoint that we will work to equate to the equivalence point. The general principles and concepts we developed with acid-base titrations apply here as well. Now, the calculations are quite straightforward. Consider a solution of sodium iodide, 0.1 molar, and a volume of 25 milliliters. If we wanted to titrate it to determine the iodide concentration, we could use the reaction with silver ions that would precipitate out silver iodide. We could use a solution of silver nitrate, 0.05 molar. The KSP for silver iodide is 8.3 times 10 to the minus 17. The reaction to form AGI has a very large equilibrium constant, and each drop of added titrant will convert completely to the solid precipitant. Any silver that remains in solution will be a result of this sparingly soluble AGI. As with other titrations, we can split the calculation into four different ones. The beginning, the equivalence point, the region between the beginning and the equivalence point, and the region past the equivalence point. Experimentally, we could follow the silver ion concentration electrochemically using an ion-specific electrode for silver ions. The experiment would be essentially like an acid-base titration, except that at the beginning there is no silver present. We will follow the progress of the titration on a graph with added titrant on the x-axis and PAG, the negative base 10 log of the silver ion concentration, on the y-axis. At the beginning there is no silver ion present. PAG is undefined. We can kind of think of it as positive infinity, but it really is just undefined. This point is never on the graph, but after the tiniest amount of added titrant, the PAG, PAG value is defined. In the region before the equivalence point, we have to account for three things, reaction, solubility, and dilution. Consider the addition of 10 milliliters of titrant. The total volume is now 35 milliliters, so we will have dilution from that. The moles of added silver is 0.01 liters times 0.05 molar, or 0 0.0005 moles. This reacts with an equivalent amount of iodide. The iodide left over is 0 0.0025 minus 0 0.005, or 0 0.002 moles. This, when divided by the new volume, gives an iodide concentration of 0 0.0571 molar. <clears throat> Any silver is present because of solubility of the precipitating silver iodide. Use KSP with this value for the iodide concentration, and the silver ion concentration is 1.45 times 10 to the minus 15 molar. And that gives a PAG of 14.84. And here is that data point on the graph. We do the same thing for 20 milliliters of added titrant. Jump to 40 milliliters of added titrant. Calculations are all the same. How much added silver? How much iodide remains? What's the diluted concentration of iodide? Use KSP for silver concentration and PAG. Now the equivalence point will be 50 milliliters. Here we calculate for only one milliliter away at 49 milliliters. And here is 50 milliliters, the equivalence point. This is just like a solution of added silver iodide. Just take the square root of the KSP, the two concentrations are equal. And now beyond the equivalence point, just take the silver added in excess of the equivalence point, find its diluted concentration, get PAG. There's no need to calculate the iodide concentration using KSP. And here is another point beyond the equivalence point. Now we could calculate more points. Indeed, the whole titration curve looks like this. So much of what we discovered with acids and bases applied equally here. Finding the equivalence point using calculus, using the equivalence point to find the concentration of an unknown, there are some special indicators that could be used under certain special conditions. Here's one example. When titrating a solution of chloride using silver nitrate, the fine particles of silver chloride precipitate out of solution. And the surrounding solution has a much higher concentration of chloride than it does of silver cations. And the particles are covered with chloride ions, imparting a negative surface charge to these solid particles. An indicator, dichlorofluorescein, is itself negatively charged in solution, so it is repelled from the solid silver chloride particles. When the titration passes through the equivalence point, suddenly the predominant ion becomes the silver ion, which starts to coat the surface of the silver chloride particles. Now they're positively charged, and the silver chloride particles attract the dichlorofluorescein, which upon adsorption change their optical properties and quickly impart a pink color to the solution, indicating the endpoint of the titration. Now, as far as examinations go, it's not likely that you would encounter a question asking to create a whole titration curve, whether precipitation, acid-base, or whatever. You might, however, likely run into a question asking you to calculate 
for a value at a certain point in the titration. For example, for the titration of 20 milliliters of a solution that is 0.0692 molar in silver, silver ion with 0 0.02793 molar ferrocyanide, write a balanced reaction equation. What is PAG at the equivalence point? What is PAG when 8 milliliters of titrant has been added? The KSP of silver ferrocyanide is 8.5 times 10 to the minus 45. Note that the precipitating species has four silver ions pairing with one ferrocyanide complex species. Here's the balanced reaction equation. And this is the solubility equilibrium expression we will use. At the equivalence point, it is as if we just added the solids precipitate to the solution. So we can solve it just like a solubility problem. Note that four silver ions will enter solution for each ferrocyanide complex ion. We take the fifth root to obtain a value of 5.06 times 10 to the minus 10 molar. This is the system's solubility. It is the concentration of ferrocyanide, but it's only one quarter the concentration of silver. Multiply by four to obtain the silver concentration, 2.02 times 10 to the minus nine, and a PAG at that equivalence point of 8.694. So what about the eight milliliter point? Well, first, what's the volume of added titrate at the equivalence point? The amount of silver ions at the beginning of the titration is 1.384 millimolar. The amount of ferrocyanide that must combine with this amount of silver for the equivalence point is just one quarter because of the stoichiometry being 4 to 1. The amount of ferrocyanide added at the equivalence point is 3.46 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. And with the titrant concentration, we find that the equivalence point volume is 12.40 milliliters. So the 8 milliliter point is before the equivalence point. How much ferrocyanide has been added at this point? We've added 2.232 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of ferrocyanide at that point. It will have all reacted with silver ions to form a precipitate. The amount of silver that will have reacted, however, is four times this amount, 8.928 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. So how much silver is left in the solution at this point? Subtract that amount that is reacted from the original amount of silver. So there's still 4.912 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of silver in the, in the solution. The concentration of silver is therefore and now a warning, do not forget about dilution. The total volume is now 20 plus 8 or 28 milliliters. The silver concentration is 17.54 millimolar, which gives a PAG of 1.756. Note how the PAG is rising during this titration. The precipitation titration curve will have the general shape of the curve of the titration of an acid when we are following the analyte. It will follow the shape of a titration of a base when we are following the titrant. It is quite a lot to calculate a point <clears throat> on the titration curve. Here is a right way to find the entire curve. If we use a spreadsheet and think about the problem backwards, we can come up with some equations that allow us to readily calculate a titration curve for these systems. Now some definitions for our, der our derivation. First, the concentration of the titrant. This is its concentration in the burette, not in the solution. This is the number which is the same throughout the titration. The original concentration of the analyte. The analyte concentration will be changing throughout the titration, but this is its value right at the beginning. It too is a constant. Note that we will be working in molarity, so both concentrations need to be reported in molarity. The original volume of the analyte. Since we will be working in molarity, the volumes also need to be in liters. It's common to convert to milliliters at the end because burettes are generally labeled in milliliters, but our calculations need to be in liters the volume of added titrant at the point in the titration. Now this variable is changing throughout the calculation and it needs to be reported in liters. Now at this point you need to make two choices. What is the stoichiometry of the precipitation reaction? Now this also dictates the form of the KSP expression and the form of the equations will depend on the stoichiometry. The concept and approach is the same but we have to tailor the equations to each form of reaction. Second, do you want to follow the analyte concentration, because it will be decreasing throughout the reaction, or do you want to follow the titrant concentration, which will be increasing? In practice, this means that you will be choosing what kind of sensor you would be using in the actual titration. In principle, you could follow either one, and the graph will be rising or lower, lowering depending upon how you design your experiment. The equivalence point will be the same in both cases, however. For this example, let's use the silver iodide precipitation we worked on at the first. Silver is the titrant, iodide is the analyte. We use a silver ion specific electrode 
So we are following the concentration of titrant in the solution. We use two mass balance equations to solve this problem, the mass balance for the analyte and the mass balance for the titrant. At any point, the titration, beginning, middle, equivalence point, after equivalence point, at any point, the moles of original analyte must equal the sum of the moles of analyte in the solution and the moles of analyte in the precipitate. And in the case of the titrant, also at any point, the moles of added titrant must equal the sum of the moles of titrant in solution and the moles of titrant in the precipitate. Now mathematically, we could write this as concentration of original analyte times its original volume being equal to the current analyte concentration times the current volume plus the moles of precipitate. The current volume is the sum of the original volume plus the volume of added titrant at this point. This is just the dilution factor. Now I've made this specific to the silver iodide precipitation titration. This equation reflects the stoichiometry of the silver iodide precipitate. One mole of precipitate corresponds to one mole of iodide. If the stoichiometry were different, this is where a multiplicative factor would be introduced to account for that stoichiometry. The mass balance for the titrant is similar. Equate the moles of added titrant with the sum of the moles of added of titrant in solution and the moles of titrant in the precipitate. Note how the volume of the titrant is the variable that is changing experimentally. Now the actual solution concentration of the analyte and the titrant will then be varying in response. And we want to know the value of one or the other and graph it against the volume of added tit titrant. And this will be our titration curve. In order to proceed, we note that a simple reorganizing of the two mass balance equations produces an interesting equality. When we are at the same value of added titrant, the amount of precipitate is obviously the same. And this would be true at any value of added titrant. So we can equate the two left-hand sides of the two reorganized mass balance equations. We start from here, multiply out the terms, gather together on one side the terms in the titrant volume, and on the other side the terms in the analyte original volume. Factor out the two concentration terms. Our experimental variable is the added titrant volume. We can isolate for that variable. At any point in the process, the analyte concentration is related to the titrant con concentration through the KSP expression. We put this expression in so that it only involves the titrant concentration. Our expression <clears throat> relates the titrant concentration and the add titrant volume. But it seems a little backward. Experimentally, we think of controlling the titrant volume. We adjust the stop clock on the burette ourselves and think of it as the independent variable. We graph it on the x-axis of the graph, and we think of the two species concentrations as being the dependent variables, the ones that vary as they depend upon the titrant volume. And experimentally, that is true. But for our calculations, why do we have to be constrained by that situation? This expression allows us to choose titrant concentration and then determine the added volume that's needed to give that concentration. This can readily be set up in the spreadsheet to calculate the entire titration curve. In fact, the curves I have shown you so far have been calculated in this manner. But why not solve the equation like we would usually and determine the concentration from an added titrant volume? Well, we can do that. Start back at the second equation in the derivation. This time we will try to gather the analyte concentration terms and the titrant concentration terms. We can again replace the analyte volume with the solubility product to obtain the titrant volume as the only concentration unknown. Clear out the denominator. Gather terms of the same power in titrant concentration. We obtain a quadratic equation, which is, of course, solved with a quadratic formula. We could also use this in Excel to plot out the titration curve. Now in this case, we choose a sequence of added titrant volumes and calculate the titrant concentration. Both approaches are equally valid and they give the same result. So what's different? Well, the difference arises when the stoichiometry is different than one to one. Higher order polynomials arise when you try to solve for the titrant concentration using the second approach. Then a numerical solution would have to be used for every single data point. It's possible and it works, but it is a pain. The first approach has a different equation, but it is still directly solvable and can easily produce the titration curve. Without going through the derivation, the equation for the titration of silver with the ferrocyanide solution gives rise to this expression. The stoichiometry gives rise to the additional multiplicative terms, but there are no new powers that arise in the variable for which we are solving. The calculation is straightforward.
choose a p ferrocyanide, substitute a concentration, find the volume of added titrant to give that concentration, easy peasy. You can just as easily cast it in terms of the silver concentration.